What's up? What's up? What's up? This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast. Chad Belding back, back at you. Another great episode. Thank you guys so much. Thank you girls so much for all the direct messages. And we're so humbled by the growth of our podcast. Don't forget about our sister podcast, The Foul Life. And we also have a brand new podcast launching. It's going to be entitled where the pavement ends. It's going to be hosted by Alex Crosby, my brothers, Clay Belding and Clint Belding. They're going to talk about big game, archery, rifle, long distance shooting, trap lines, predator hunting, turkey hunting, you name it, living off the land, the provider mentality, cooking wild food. So be looking for that from the This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast umbrella, the family of podcasts that we're building here. And again, thank you guys so much for subscribing, leaving us ratings and reviews, and please continue to support the partners and sponsors that support us. Today's episode, of This Life Ain't For Everybody is brought to you by our friends at Lear Camper Tops. We depend on Lear to keep every bit of our personal gear, hunting gear, family gear, camping gear, outdoor gear, protected at all times, whether we're staying at a hotel, at a lodge, we're on the road, we're eating dinner, it's locked, it's loaded, and it's secure. We have our dogs in there, our dog kennels, our deck systems. Lear, L-E-E-R, your camper top professionals, the innovators, the originators. Again, we depend on them, so please support Lear Counter Camper Shells. They absolutely are the best on the market, and I'm not just saying that. You guys got to check out all the new innovation coming out of the Lear factory right now. Today's guest is my good buddy. You've heard him here before in a three or four part series we did a year ago on his success in the bill fishing, the ocean fishing, the bass fishing, Lake Okeechobee, South Florida, the sportsman's paradise. They call him the cannon, the renegade. He comes from the cannon family. His brother is a stud. His dad, Rob, is a stud. And I just received a package that makes me love this family even more. And in that package was yellowfin. In that package, was swordfish in that package was mahi this man can catch them all he's done it all he's a master of the deer woods the turkey woods brett cannon welcome my brother from another mother oh thank you buddy that's uh quite an introduction there i don't know if it's all true but I it appreciate was all it. it was all freestyled like freaking yeah. eminem you know just like Dude, off I, the cuff i couldn't even talk that long in a sentence like <laughs> i don't even know how you do that i like oh my gosh i'm like well listen to your intro and i'm like wow this guy's amazing I, I, some people think when I'm looking over there, I have a teleprompter, but I was looking at, I have a picture in the studio of Leith Lofton and, and he's like on a bench playing a guitar and you know how he gets into it, you know? So I like look for that for inspiration and then I just start talking, but I'm serious, dude, you've been, you've been on a, on a, uh, just a nonstop outdoor uh, I don't know what you really call it. You're just enthralled with being in the outdoors. You actually live in the country now I've heard, right? Yeah, you've moved, moved out. You've moved yeah. out of like downtown Fort Lauderdale, kind of. Yeah, I lived in Party Central. You know, it's like where everybody goes to hang out. It's spring break. It's nonstop. It's just it wasn't really me, you know. So I had to move. I moved about an hour north, and the acreage it's called. I got like an acre and a half, which is crazy down here. Um, normally, your neighbors can spit on each other, so I had to do it, man. Like I got donkeys in my backyard. <laughs> my neighbors got donkeys and stuff, so it's a little different. But do you like it? Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like so it. what, and you're living with a girlfriend, fiance, yeah. girlfriend, what's the deal? Is there a ring on this girl's finger yet? What's no. her name? She's from Louisiana. Is she an outdoorsman? She's in a lot of your content fishing. Now she's killing turkeys, hogs. I mean, you meet Brett Cannon and he falls in love with you. You're pretty much your, you know, the golden ticket to the outdoors. So she's probably just like living high on the hog. Yeah. Who is she? What's she all about? Who in the freak could pin Brett Cannon down is the question really. Yeah. Um, it's her name's Emily Carrera. She's from Louisiana a small town out of uh, New Orleans called like Slidell and uh yeah she's a little she's a little redneck so she is uh yeah yeah I don't know I don't really know what happened all it's all a blur I kind of passed out I don't even know if it's real life right now I mean do you even talk to Kip Kip or any of the guys anymore Yeah oh yeah oh yeah Do you go to American Social anymore No I stay I stay away from uh, Well you're not allowed in those places right now No yeah that's just probably a good thing but no, I mean, I, we're just busy. I'm trying to get her more involved. You know, she's, she loves it. So just trying to teach her, we got her a new, a new bow and she's been shooting her bow. She's really wants to go duck hunting with you, but I told her it's during deer season. We can't do that. But well, she doesn't, I mean, you can still deer hunt. She can just come duck hunting with me. Yeah. You can okay. trust me. <laughs> well, you don't trust me. I do. Well, that's kind of messed up. So uh, you're in the country, but I want to talk about, 
the South Florida lifestyle a little bit more. I just want some specifics on these videos you sent me the other day. When, when you're in the ocean, do you have to be bait specific like you do when you're bass fishing or fly fishing per se, matching the hatch? When you're out there, are you trying to catch sailfish all the time and you just happen to run into some mahi or happen to run into some yellowfin tuna? Or are you going bait specific, species specific? Do you know that in this depth of water, this time of year, this temperature of water, those yellowfin are going to be running right now? Is there a migration where they come down the East Coast and get down to Southern Florida like a duck or a goosewood or how do you guys get that many yellowfin on the dock at one time there's got to be a science to it yeah yeah no we were target pacific for sure but when you're going to an area where the yellowfin are you kind of we found a floater so we found a big giant piece of bamboo and it had just mahi all, all over and that's what you look for you look for birds so you know when we're sail fishing we'll have kites out we're strictly trying to go for sailfish but mahi will come through but we're in a depth where we know hey this is where the selfish like to be. If we want to go for mahi, we like to go out deeper, you know, a little further offshore. So yeah, we knew that we were going for yellowfin and uh, hoping and praying we saw some frigate birds, some hawks or some things that the dolphin might be on or the mahi so we could have a mixed bag, you know, trying to know our limit. We were, we stayed in, in all of our limit, but man, we could have had a, a, a unbelievable day, but the sharks are getting so bad down here, man, that we lost probably 25 yellowfin big yellowfin to sharks that day they were eating them off your hook mm -hmm. what kind of shark bunch of just big i've seen like probably giant tiger sharks over there there's a bunch of just giant reef sharks there were at one point we had the yellowfins eating from the boat i could see them 60 to 80 pound yellowfins i'm like oh my gosh and under them were like three or four giant sharks and so you're like oh what you know this is where where is is the is this in between like Miami and the Bahamas, where are you at? Or are you in a different part? Because me and you jump into that water all the time when we're fishing. You don't have to tell me specifically. I can't tell you my secrets. I know, so but you, you're, like you, you don't jump in the ocean anymore if the sharks are getting this bad then, I, I assume. Okay, I'll jump in the, I have brought my underwater camera and I was like, I'm going to get some epic, epic footage of these, my, or these yellow fins eating cut bait and all this. And then the sharks, I'm like, I ain't getting in the water. There's no chance. There's no chance. No chance. But would you ever again, are you going to jump in the ocean if the sharks are getting this bad out when you're fishing? Because you and I would get up on the deck and jump in all the time. I don't understand. Were we putting ourselves in harm's way? If I'm around fish and I'm catching fish and stuff, I won't get in the water. But if I'm just like out in the middle of the ocean, I'll jump in. But that's the thing about the freaking ocean is that you're always around fish. You're all, you never know what is under that freaking water. Like when you're in the bear woods, you will smell a grizzly or hear a grizzly grunting, or at least, you know, you're, you're going to be notified. Sometimes maybe a, a freaking mountain lion might jump out of a tree right onto your back and just start lacing your ass. But in the ocean, you have no idea. And a shark can cover so much ground so quick. Why would you ever get into the ocean again? Now I'm starting to understand why people don't go in the freaking ocean, especially when you're out that far. Yeah, I've, I have. I know two people, people personally, close friends that have been bitten by sharks. So, I mean, I've had a, a 10 foot mako shark, or I'm sorry, not a mako, a bull shark. I had a 10 foot bull shark charge me as fast as he could when I was like, I, I freaked out. Yeah, I mean, I don't typically like to get in the water anymore, honestly, because now we're having an issue with sharks on our coast, like only 150 feet out where we'll, you'll have a sailfish on somebody will be catching their first one and they'll get eaten in half or you'll have a kingfish. And that hasn't happened. That's like, what, what would cause this? Do they have any idea? Is it just the, the ocean turning over? What, what yeah. do they have any idea why, why the sharks are in that area so big right now? I think what happened is they, they shut down some commercial net, like some nets and stuff like that, that used to kind of like keep the shark population down. Well, now they have no predators. So they're just, they're the apex and you can't kill them. It's just like the issue that you, you know, people have with mountain lions and grizzlies and things like that. If you were to shut down grizzly hunting or shut down wolves and all that, you know, they're going to overtake. And I think we're having that same issue with sharks right now. God, man, I'm never jumping in again. I, I, I don't know if there'd be a worse way to die. Being burnt to death is drowning. I mean, there, here's the thing about shark is that you're dying in two ways. You're get bleeding to death, mm -hmm. you're getting eaten to death, and yeah. bleeding to death, and then you're drowning to death at the same time. Yeah. I don't it's think that there could be a worse thing in the world. Check this out. 
the week before we went to catch him, Tim's brother went and he caught one that got sharked and he only brought caught the what? Head, a yellow fin. They call it getting sharked when it gets beaten. He only had from the gills up and it was 67 pounds. So that shark bit, I mean, it could literally bite your head off instantly. Half of your body. Yeah. Gone. 67 pound head. The head was 67 pounds. Yeah. So Matt, it was over a hundred and something pound fish that it literally ate with one bite. Holy shit. Clean cut. God, I don't know if I, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if I will ever get in the ocean again, even off of a beach. I just don't think it's worth it, man. Yeah, I will. I'll go scuba. I mean, cause I like diving. Those guys, that, those guys that dive for lobsters right off of Boca Raton and right off a of lighthouse in Fort Lauderdale, that's gotta be, uh, did sharks come in that? Uh, sharks could come into anywhere. Yeah. You can see them though. That's what's cool. Like you can see them and know. Like, okay. So what I, do you do when I you see them? You, I want to take you to go, um, mobstering and marathon in the keys. I got like a hundred spots and it's all from eight. It's honestly eight feet. So like you look around, you can be like, Oh, okay. There's no sharks around. You could see eight feet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so, but once you dive, a shark could be on you in a matter of minutes. You, we walk in there, we stub our toe, we cut ourselves a little bit. We got a little bit of blood dripping off. We're freaking bait. No, it's not like that. It's like it's that. Tough. It's like that in some areas, especially over in the Bahamas. Hey, like I will I won't get in the water. Speaking of floaters, explain this to me. So a, a lot, I've told people that a lot I'm of, t- toilet, bro. <laughs> huh? What'd you say? I said not on the toilet. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. But floaters out in the ocean, are they're going to hold bugs, right? They're going to hold the stuff, stuff that is going to keep falling off of it. And that's why the fish congregate around them. Yeah. It's just like a, like a chain of events, I guess. It's like the little fish and then the, the littler fish eat the bigger fish. So it's like, so it's like plank, phytoplankton, like all that. It's got barnacles on it. As, as soon as it has barnacles, then it starts having all the other fish on it. And then I'll have like the little bait fish and then I'll have the mahi and then the mahi, then I'll have a marlin. So it's like the mahi are eating the little bait, the little bait's eating the plankton and the, the barnacle stuff, whatever it's got. And then the marlin eat the mahi. So do you remember... I don't even remember if you were there or I went out that day with your dad and your, I don't remember if you were on the boat this day, but do you remember the floaters that we found when I was there that were illegal floaters? And I was like, let's get one. And your dad's like, uh, hell no, we're not touching it. Were you uh, on the I found bales? Huh? You guys saw bales or something? What are bales? Was it like marijuana or yeah, from well, the- cocaine or cocaine? Yeah. That happens a lot. So we go out. And we're rolling and your dad or Jeremy, I don't know if you were on the boat this day. I think you had a wedding or something. Yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, We go out and we're rolling. We're like, there's a floater up here. So we get going on it and we get up to it. And it's this, it's, it's like saran wrap. It looks like this clear plastic wrapped around yellow duct tape ish looking stuff wrapped around another material. And then there was another one like a hundred yards from it. And it, and then I watched that movie. I think it was, I don't know if it was the Tom Cruise movie or whatever, but these planes just float in there and drop them off in places. I don't know if they got GPS trackers on them or what, but then a boat obviously goes out there, picks them up to run them into Miami. Right. Something like that. But dude, I could have been debt free. You know that right now. If you guys you would have picked them up. It, heck yeah. No, your dad said not to your dad, because if they got a GPS on it, they track that deal to your house. You're smoked by the cartel, dude made a sweet movie about me <laughs> yeah, yeah that that is a good point though is that it's a great feeling to be dead and then have a movie made about you that's always good that's always good well at least my family can see it yeah so yeah no. that, i remember that day man it was just like they were they it really happens down there in that part of america i'm sure it happens yeah. off the coast of california too i think too, what happens is i've been checked by coast guard several times especially if you're coming from the bahamas, the bahamas. And I think what happens, a lot of those guys see that on the radar, that boat coming, oh crap, and they start bailing them off and know the depths, look at their, you know, their coordinates and be like, all right, we got a north current, so drop them off here and maybe send a boat out to try to get them later or something. Oh, like that, that makes sense. So you're saying that they might not necessarily be being dropped from airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. So I would think that some planes would fly over there, drop them, and then tell the guys, hey, the current's this. They're going to be right in this area here. Get out well, there and find them or something. Well, now with, like, all technology they'll do is they'll put little, like, Garmin units or something in there with a tracker that they know where that thing is. Because they'll do that on out in Costa Rica. If they find, like, a giant, awesome, 
like you'll find a whole tree out there floating. And what they'll do is they'll like attach a Garmin unit on it and have another one and have locate that. And so they'll, they'll just leave that Garmin for like a day or two, find it and know that by the time in two days, that tree is going to be loaded with Marlin, Mahi, all that kind of stuff. And then they go to it. And I've found tracking beacons on man-made, um, I guess they call them fads. It's fish attracting devices or whatever. And there'll be like a tree, some buoys, some palm fronds and stuff all wrapped together with a bunch of just crap, you know, and there'll be a satellite beacon right on top of it. And the fishermen put those out there, they build them and then place them to do exactly what we just talked about to be a, a floater. Yeah. I think that's more commercial fishing guys will do that. Is it but legal to do? I don't, I don't know. I don't know over there in, in Costa Rica. I'm not quite sure. So if you're target specific on these, what's that? I think to to make your own, I'm not sure. But if you're commercial, I think you can. But these guys are just putting a a satellite on like a tree that they didn't, that was just out there, you know? So I think it's different if you made it yourself versus finding it out there and like putting a satellite on it or something. So you can't tell secrets, but will once you find the floater and you see all the yellow fin underneath it or the mahi, will those fish bite anything that you throw into the water at that time? A lot of times, yeah. They're just that aggressive. If it just looks, uh, if they just get curious, they'll smoke it. If it looks like something they could eat. Oh yeah, mahi are just ferocious. And I always tell people if mahi were to get like two hundred pounds, I wouldn't get in the water. They just will eat everything and anything, and then they get a little smart. Like you'll get go to a school of like twenty five, thirty of them. You'll catch twenty of them, and then the five will be like, all right, I'm kind of had enough. I've seen all my my buddies go in the box, so I'm gonna I'm gonna not eat, but. My brother went, my brother was out fishing the other day and came up to a, a, a tree and he said one of the biggest mahi he's ever seen, 25 or like, actually, I'm sorry, like 50 pounds plus something like that. He's like 25 miles offshore and it didn't eat anything he threw at it. So it might've been pressure. I don't know, but 90% of the times, man, they'll, they'll eat everything you throw at them. Wow. But live bait, obviously, if you have the live bait, you troll by them. Then what you do is you keep one in the water and then you, throw cut bait and then they just, it's like a big feeding frenzy. And then you got dinner. Are, are, are yellowfin tuna the same way? They Not really. I mean, they're finicky. They're harder to catch unless you have them really like just next to the boat, just eating them a bunch. But it, it, we had to work for all those fish, but yeah, yellowfin are just, they're so fun, but they fight. So a year, a year ago or whenever you were here, maybe a little bit longer than that, you guys were just now getting into the new boat. It was, is it another conch? Conch. Conch. Yeah, conch. And the conch is a custom boat that they only build a certain amount a year. Are they, where are they built? Are they in Florida? Florida. Yep. What's so special about the conch? It's just a fishing platform. It's not like a weekend. It's not like a family boat. It's just strictly fishing. It's got low gunnels. It's like just the fishing platform is amazing. It doesn't rot. I mean, it's a little wet, but it's just the fishing platform is by far like the best in my opinion. So what? in old, uh, you remember a show back in the day, oh, Jose Wa Heavy? Oh yeah. Or, Spanish yeah. fly. Spanish fly. He was the one that really got conk on the map because he used to run a conk back did in the he day. Really? Yeah. Down there. How did he die? I can't remember. I was asked this year, and, and, and we had to respectfully, um, postpone till next year, but I've been asked to donate a hunt to his wife's Spanish fly foundation for the big memorial dinner they do every year to raise money for charity. So we're going to be donating a hunt to that deal in Florida next year. I don't know where the hunt will be, but, um, probably California since that's where I'm going to just stay and hunt from now on, I think. Yeah. What are you going to do out there? Just hunt. Cali? Yeah, people, people, um, I've been going all over the country. I love everywhere in the world, but man, California speckle belly hunting's got my attention right now. It's so mm. fun. That doesn't and there's, even interest me one bit. Huh? It doesn't even interest me a bit. If you went one time, and I mean this, if you got under geese or ducks with me one time, you would never be that dork that goes to camp and puts your clothes in a oxygenated free bag and and then spray your deer piss all over your legs and your trees and throw the powder up in the air to see now where the winds talking. come now you're talking. deer hunters are absolutely 
whack jobs. They're just weirdos. But anyway, besides that, if you I ever put a if, plastic, if white plastic bag on the ground and kill speckle belly geese and white no, geese, that's and the whole, that's the whole misnomer. You would never kill one. You'd never kill one. Millions of them. You hunt where they're gonna be. Like I'm hunting. Tra- I gotta outsmart the smartest animal out there. Really, there really, you gotta outsmart it. Dude, a brain on a goose is what? Like, I mean, I don't know. Probably a little smaller than mine. Um, you're you're gonna. Okay, I don't even want to hear it about this. The the difference. These things have to leave thousands of miles up north and make their way down south and survive all of those elements, all of those hunters, all of those predators, and they got to have GPS and maps. A deer goes to where the feeder goes off and the bell rings and y'all munching on clothes. I mean, y'all build food plots to bring them in. I don't want to hear that we have decoys. You guys build food plots and have deer feeding in them. You guys are so silly. You build pits in the ground and put dang you cook breakfast and talk and yeah. and then air, socializing. Oh, hey, they come. All right. Hide out. They're going to come right in our decoys. We don't really have to call, but we'll call just to make it look like we're actually interacting. With <laughs> Hence the reason why deer wild. hunters are weird. You guys don't have any social skills because you spend so much time alone and duck hunters are all camaraderie and cutting up and cooking biscuits and gravy. Deer that's hunters are. Fishing. That's why I go turkey hunting. That's why I do other turkey, turkey hunting. You're by yourself too. No, I'm not. I'm with a group. I'm walking and talking, son. I'm no, in you're not. No, you're not. I've been turkey hunting with you, and it's like being behind Hitler. You are a dick when it comes to turkey hunting. Shh, shh, you're stomping to our shh. And it's not camaraderie or socializing. Son. All right, yeah, you might be right. But. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've been there, done that. When you So when you when you are get these things back, these yellow fins, Talk to me a little bit about these videos that I'm watching right now. What you be, you're becoming a master at homemade sushi, at customizing sushi. You're using this yellowfin tuna raw, fresh out the ocean, and you're turning it into rolls. Yeah, and Bluefin, you know, the that place I took you to, Bluefin. Oh man! Me and they asked me if I had if I could work on weekends. That's how good my rolls are. Where they see your stuff at? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. If I was a lawyer, I would have picked that apart because Bluefin's <laughs> on a different level. Yeah, no. I tell you what, the first one. So I'm I'm new at it, but I just man, I don't know. I just enjoyed it. I was like, man, I just caught this. It's the freshest fish you can buy, or you can't buy. Like obviously, um, I'm like, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make rolls. I went to the the Asian market. Never been to an Asian market in my life, and then right now, it's probably wasn't the smartest thing to go to an Asian market. But I went there. And I said, listen, I'm going to start making tuna rolls. She goes, okay. I said, I need every single thing I could, you could possibly think of that I can, I need to make rolls. So the rollers, I mean, everything I bought the works, I bought like $300 worth of stuff to make. I, I bought stuff too that I had no idea what it was. I bought some fake crab. I bought all this, the row, all the stuff. And I just talked to Tim. Tim's good at it. You know, his son's good at it now. And then I start looking on YouTube and man, now I'm just like, I want more. I want to do it more. I want to, I really wanted to make a bunch and overnight them to you to try them too. Cause I made, I've obviously made several that were good. And I made a couple that I just kind of experimented with that weren't good at all, but I'm just, I don't know. Now it's like my little, little side gig now. How do you make the rice? The sticky rice. Um, I actually bought, I actually took some from Tim one day and then Emily made the sticky rice. She just got a rice cooker and just added the ingredients and the sugar, the water or the, the, some kind of paper or some kind of, I mean, there's all kinds of little So you don't know how to make the rice. We got to get Emily in here. You're telling me that you got hired by a sushi restaurant, but you don't know how to make the rice. I mean, it's just like, but you uh doing it you can make i can make the rice that just wasn't my part i gave her the part of making the rice i cut the fish i made all the all the presentation i did all the other stuff and yeah i'm a sushi guy so back to that remark you just made real quick you're making me hungry have you had one of these yet you see that in the camera a no have you not had this it's been on the market for about eight months the no. cold the cold craft series by jack links that stuff man dude it's look at this this is two dollars and 49 cents they come pre-marked by jack link's factory to where a retailer cannot upsell them they cannot mark them up 
you peel it apart like this. Look, it's like a little Ziploc bag that's sealed. And you got two, you got a piece of pepper jack cheese, real thin pepper jack cheese, and then two thick pieces of Genoa salami on the inside. No bread, no starch. You just got a little Linkwich sandwich. Watch. Thanks. I haven't had lunch yet. Dude, look at that. That's yeah, a perfect that, bite. Yeah, that is. You so back be. to what you were saying. Maybe Wait, no, I go. trade you some of these for some rolls. Tell Jack Links that I'll trade him some sushi rolls. I'll start making him some sushi rolls. We'll package them, and he just gives me some of those. What, what about me? I'll send you some of my supply, and you overnight me a couple of these rolls. I'm going back to your comment about I want to try these rolls. Yeah, you do want to try them. So you need to get your ass down here and try some rolls. So you want to overnight them? No. Why? Because it's not going to, first of all, when they, once they scan them and see when I put my stamp on it and I scan, they scan it <laughs> FedEx, they're going to be like, Nope, they're going to open that box and they're going to eat it. Well, you don't have a stamp. First of all, <laughs> unbelievable. Well, the attitude hasn't changed since I've seen you last. The male yeah. model, Brett Cannon. Um, so what we're going in these rolls? I'm watching the video right now. What you? What vegetables are you using? Is it? Are you doing a just a regular tuna and cucumber roll, or are you getting? Are you using a deep fat fry? I don't like any sushi. The things that I will not eat in sushi are fried or cream yep. cheese. It has to be a hundred percent raw. And I know I've gotten to the point now to where I barely even dip it in any wasabi or soy. I talked to Chad Ward about that yesterday. If I do, it's just a tip of the fish. I never put the rice around it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think cream cheese is weird in the first place to eat just by itself or on a bagel or whatever. But in sushi, it's an absolute no, no, like that shouldn't even be allowed. In my opinion, I just like the raw fish and vegetables. I like vegetables in it too. You're mm -hmm. using sauces on the top. What what vegetables are you using in this, and what sauces? Are you mixing your own sauce, or do you buy those at the Asian market too? Yeah, well, I'm new. I haven't really gotten to making my own sauces yet, but uh, I did have cream cheese on a couple of them. But, yeah, it was just tuna. Most of it was just tuna, you know, um, cucumber. There was I, – I had mango. I had jalapeno. I had uh, – it was like a chive. It was like a – I think it's what it is, man. I'm I'm not a cook. I'm not like on ward status, but I just mixed them. I just started mixing stuff. And it just turned out awesome. Isn't that the best just to get creative? Yeah. There's one I put like just a dab of eel sauce in the middle. Instead of putting it on the outside, I just kind of had the eel sauce in the roll before I rolled it. And it was really good. And then I one I did one of them I did, I like seared a thin strip of tuna. I put like uh Oh, what was that? I put poppy seeds and then I had a, it's like a blackened seasoning and I seared the tuna all the way around on a little piece. And then I put that in the roll and cut that. So it had a little like seared taste to it with uh kimchi and like some hotter, some like spicy as more of a spicier roll. Oh, dude. That sounds on. freaking on. So let's get into this. Let's talk about this in your estimate, Brett Cannon, when you and your dad go out there, how many guys were on the boat on that day? Was it three of you? No, there were six. Six guys out there. What's the limit legally that you can catch in the Atlantic Ocean? Or how do they do that in Florida? Is it a, a Florida limit? Is that considered Florida water? Um, when you're fishing the ocean, how do they – is it the U.S. Coast Guard that would give you a ticket? Or are there Florida game wardens in, in the in Coast the Guard, ocean? Yeah, the Coast Guard doesn't. It would be like FWC or somebody like that. Um, but, yeah, you have to buy – like when you come – when you bring fish to Florida – Obviously, if you catch them in the middle, that's why I think, I think like, I don't know the line. Was it seven miles off is when it's like international waters where you can start gambling and like the cruise ships can gamble and all that kind of stuff or whatever. So I think it's wherever you bring those fish in. So you're allowed 18 pelagics and then you're allowed, tw I think it's 10 mahi per, per person or, or like 50 per boat. Um, so we had we had 26 mahis, 25 mahis, and we had about 14 tuna species. So oh. we were within our legal limit, yeah. We had blackfin. We had 11 yellowfin and four blackfin, so it's 15. Are blackfin good eating? Yeah, they're good. I use those. I, I'll do sear. I won't eat. I don't do those raw as much as yellowfin because yellowfin is just so much better, but I'll sear them 
I'll make tuna fish, my own tuna. I'll do tuna steaks. You got to. What's really... the best for raw? Is bluefin the highest quality raw tuna? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think bluefin. Are those the ones that they catch on the deadliest, and not the deadliest catch, but the the tuna wars or whatever it's called? And they'll sell some of them sell for like a million dollars or something crazy. In Japan, right? I mean, are those the ones bluefin? Those are bluefin, but they're I like think thousand it, pounds, twelve hundred pounds. Some of or some of them get bigger than that, maybe. Yeah, I think they can. Yellowfin are harder to catch. I feel like, and then you know you have to catch more of them. So, Kit and I both like yellowfin better than bluefin. So I think it's more of a personal preference. Like I think some bluefin's fattier, so it's a little. I don't know, but that yellowfin I had was. It was cool. unbelievable, unreal how good it is. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you sending it to me. So, six guys on the boat. How many hours was that day to catch that many? You said twenty five mahi and four, thirteen, fourteen. So you're you're looking at almost forty fish you brought in. Did you catch the swordfish that day? Because somebody caught a daytime sword the other time, the other day too, didn't they? Yeah, my dad caught one a day before that trip, or uh, yeah, the day before that trip, he went out swording and caught like a two hundred pound swordfish. Wow. Yeah. And those are some steaks now. Is that one of your favorite ocean cook fish? Yeah, I would have to say so. it cooked right. So I've had swordfish where I've, I've been like, ah, and then I've had it most amazing fish I've had. But all like, in all, I feel like I, you can't beat mahi to me, fresh mahi, all, all in all. Like you can do anything you want to it, and it's still unbelievable. I've done three different recipes with it so far. I, and it's just Traeger grilled, blackened. I flash fried a little bit of it, but with no breading on it. And I'm talking like every single bite. It, it just like puts me into ecstasy. That's why yeah. I'm so envious of the lifestyle down there is like, I talked to Justin Martin today, you know, Justin from Duck Commander. I was talking to him about Louisianans and how they just can cook so good with gumbos and seafoods and all the stuff that they do on a daily basis. I get envious of that, but the South, South, South Florida lifestyle, which you've always said, I'm moving out of here. I'm going back to Texas or I'm moving to Kansas. And I get it. You want to get out of that whole party zone but now has that changed a little bit moving out into the country and you see how blessed you are to live down there and or do you oh, want to no, Florida you, will always be have a special place but yeah I mean I just like hunting and stuff so much but I know it's always the grass always greener so if I go moved out there I'd miss the fishing as much as I miss the hunting now it's just like but but, but you can get on hunt. a plane you can you you can't go anywhere in the you can go anywhere in the country and kill a whitetail pretty much unless you're out west and you kill a mule deer you can't go everywhere in the country and do what you do down there, dude. No. You just can't. There's just, you can say you can, but I can't. I live three hours from San Francisco. I can't just hop in my car and go get in my, my boat that I own with my dad and go out and catch 25 mahi and 13 yellowfin. You just can't. That is a badass lifestyle. So six guys on the boat. How long is this day to catch that 40 fish? We left. We got to, we, our boat was actually at Tim's house. We got we got to the boat around 4 a.m. We loaded all the baits up because we, we brought over 1,600 pilchards that our buddies went and caught on my dad's boat, you know, two days before. We pinned them up. Then we brought them over. So we had to net all those baits into like in a scoop of like five at each each scoop. So that takes time. Then we get, then we leave. And we got back to the house probably around 10 p.m. PM. Yeah. And how far did you go offshore? Oh man, we just, we just ran and we were just running and gunning, man. It was, I think we end up running like over 200 miles total. Was it stormy day or sunny? No, it was, it was nice. It was super nice. What were the, what were the oceans? What were the one to, two, one to two in the beginning and then it clumped. It was flat, like less than a foot. Man, that was a day for me to be out there. Yeah. Anything over five, I'm pretty much staying home. Yeah. When the seas get that high, I don't know how y'all do it. I mean, it's a uh, that that'll kick your ass. I remember two fishing trips out there that I've been th- that I threw up on many a many a off the side of the boat many a times. Then so six it's guys just, duck hunters, you know, they're just not as hardcore as us. us we are. Hunters. We are. We just we just like to be dramatic. We we have a flair for the dramatic, you know, like reeling in a reeling in a marlin and throwing up at the same time. How much more Rambo esque can you get than that? Think about it. That's tough. So you're you got all this fish, you got all these rolls you're making. That's a lot of fish that you divide it between six guys, right? That's a yeah. lot of fish that you each get to keep. It just seems like a pretty good value when you factor in the time. I guess did you have to buy the sixteen hundred bait fish? No, no, we we bought the fuel 
to go down. We caught those down in Miami. So we had to run the boat all the way down to Miami. Um, oh, I thought you said somebody else caught them on your dad's boat. Well, to the guys that went with us. So the oh. part of like, Hey, you can come with us, but you got to go catch the bait. Yeah. And then, yeah, they went and called the bait. They come back and then, yeah, I mean, people don't get it. We actually got a little bit of uh, hate mail. Tim, you know, some people posted that picture and a lot of people were like, oh, killers. Like, you didn't have to keep that many. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to do that. And we were like, everything was legal. Um, and they don't understand that. I live just between myself, not Tim's side and everything. I fed 25 different families. So being able, especially in this time, I was able to bag so much up that took, I don't know, my dad and I probably eight hours to vacuum seal the, all the tuna and mahis that we got. And then I, like I said, I shipped you some, I shipped four other people some, I shipped Emily's parents some that just got, you know, that her dad just got laid off because of the COVID stuff. And I sent them a big box. And then we're going to have people comment on our stuff saying, why'd you kill so many? Like you could have left them. You didn't need all I'm like, First of all, you have no idea how many families I fed with this during this time. So I don't, I don't I, yeah. I mean, part of me wants to say, you know, go F yourself, mind your business, hater. Yeah. But then the other part of you wants to educate people. But I don't know if the people that would take the time out of their day to write a nasty message on Facebook and hide behind a, uh, you know, a keyboard muscle name. I don't know if they could ever be educated. I don't know if their ignorance is built up so so much that they could never listen to you say, look, man, we're living off the land. We're staying within our daily limit, our possession limit. We're sustainability. We're eating the fish. If we don't go and take a few out of the ocean ecosystem, they're just going to get disease and, and then spread disease through the rest of the waters, or they're going to get eaten by a shark and they're, you know, whatever they're going to, there's a, there's a price for everything there. Everything has a cost. It comes with a cost. So I don't know if it's worth you know, I look at that and I, those pictures and I look at those videos and I go, that's the only way to live. That is yeah. the only way to live. So if you're going to sit there and tell me that you're going to go to Costco and buy your tilapia, and then you're going to go home and make breaded tilapia for everybody. And you think that that's any different because they were raised at a fish farm and netted and, and k killed the way they were. It's all relevant. You know, like you shouldn't kill a deer, but I'm going to go to the steakhouse and eat a, a prime piece of Wagyu. And I'm like, well, if you've ever seen how they kill the cow, then shut up. Well, I'll just go eat chicken. I'll, well, then go to a chicken ranch or just go, go to a chicken slaughterhouse and see how they kill chicken. Everything comes with a cost. Oh, yeah. you know, it's like, it's uh, you. Why do you even want to waste your breath? When I look at those pictures and those videos and then the videos of the rolls and how much unity that that's providing for you and your dad to do all that shrink wrapping and that eight hours that you spend together, then you get the hand that fish to friends and family to feed off of it and eat it and then you and emily getting closer by creating roles and being creative there that's a camaraderie thing and a socializing thing so those people that write in those messages are the people that don't have the ability to develop those kind of relationships or run a vacuum seether or run a boat out into the ocean and catch that much fish and don't have a freaking clue the talent level that it takes to do so so really you should just write back with two words that say piss off exclamation point and then just keep running but you can't do that because then they'll call your sponsors and go brett cannon has a nasty way of returning my messages and then your sponsor should be like he should tell you that you should just not write those messages but everything's got to be so politically correct you got to walk on eggshells and ice and and glass and just be like tiptoe around the fact that we are the badasses we're the providers we know how to start a boat, run a boat, just to drive that boat's a pure talent to do what you and your dad and Timmy Maddock does. That is a badass talent to have. Then to be able to bring all of those fish home and feed that many people, nobody in their right mind should be, you guys should be ashamed of yourself. They just have nothing else to do in life to grab onto or gravitate towards or sink their fingernails into. So what do they do? They get on that keyboard and hide behind some name like badass.com or whatever. And then they write those messages and that's gets them off. Then they leave that keyboard and they think they're macho, man. They go listen to the village people soundtrack for two hours while they're pumping weights and a freaking headband and shit. It's just goofy ass people living in their mom's basement, hoping that they get to come up and have some Mac and cheese. That's the yeah. way I look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I didn't, I just, I just thought it was funny. Yeah, I like, went off on a, I went off on a little rant there, but man, I'm telling you, I don't like the fact that people just write anything that they want. Yeah. It's so bizarre to me. I've never even grasped that concept of like, if I don't like something that somebody else is doing, you know what? It is what it is. They're doing it. I'm never going to write them or write on their page or do something. 
I don't have no, I, whatever. It is what it is. It's your, do what you want. It's not affecting me in any way. Like, no, no, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, cool. I love vegetables too. I got a garden. I love it. Well, yeah. you know, you're killing animals. Um, where'd you get those vegetables? Trader Joe's. Okay. Well, where Trader Joe's get them? Uh, the farmers. And I'm like, okay, have you ever been to a farm? No. Okay. Um, do you know what a combine or a tractor is? Do you know what equipment is used to make sure that you have your kale and your strawberries? No. Okay. Do you know how many rodents were killed when they were tilling up that land? Yeah. Oh man. I never even thought about that. My buddy Remy Warren says that everything yeah. comes with a cost. So if you're a vegetarian, there's a lot of animals that are getting smoked to grow your strawberries and your asparagus. So just yeah. keep all that in mind and know that a hunter's not going to wake up and get on a keyboard or a, or a fisherman with you and your dad and, and Timmy's talent level and go, you know what? We're going to, we're going to talk shit today about vegetarians and vegans because we think you guys are the antichrist and we don't think that you should even be able to get a driver's license. We're not going to say shit like that. No, I'm not exactly. going to do it to each their own. Go do your thing. I don't care. I don't care that you grow your own deodorant or make your own hand soap that you think works. Okay. I don't care. Just live off the land. Well, we're hippies. We've been living off the land for a long time. No, not longer than hunters. I love hippies. I think hippies cool, man. Whatever you want to do. Just don't get on and belittle us because we are hunters and gatherers and fishers. Yeah. I, last time I did that, it's so funny. I had, there's three people that gave me this, oh, whatever, it was killer. You're, you should kill yourself, blah, 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 like, you know, whatever. And I went on their pages and I looked and I scrolled down. One of them, actually, one of them was in a leather coat with a leather purse, leather everything. The other one had, like a hamburger she's biting this big hamburger and whatever and then the other one has a picture next to a mounted elk like picture with it like like it was artwork like it was pretty yeah. to take a picture with i'm like interesting all leather all hamburgers all this but i'm the killer i'm like all right whatever. i can't even, i can't even deal with it anymore that's the problem is that 90 percent 90% of the people that talk that shit and hate are people that don't understand the ecosystem and, and conservation efforts and what hunters and fishermen really do. If it wasn't for hunters and fishermen, we, these antis wouldn't have an animal to look at or take a picture of. So that's all you got to tell them really how much money you put into the habitat every year. Well, not that much because you, you know, I, I'm, I'm really doing a good job at my yoga studio and all that. Okay. Well, well you're out there doing your Bikram's yoga, which is fine too. I love it. I wish I could be more flexible. But while you're out there doing that, we're out here at the NWTF convention raising money for our wild turkey population in the country. So yeah. you can take pictures of a big tom strutting on a on an albino hen if you want to. It's because of hunters that those turkeys are in the in the great shape that they are and the population is thriving. So we could talk about that till we're blue in the face. But I want to yeah. get back to this really cool phenomenon called fishing. And I think that this, these, these sushi rolls, we're onto something here. I think that we need to figure out how to get some content out of this because that's a really cool process, a really cool art. Like when I go into Bluefin and I say, I want a custom roll or I want something special that might not be on the menu. You get, you, you know, sushi and, and at retail is all about relationships, right? You got to have a relationship with the chef, the owner, you walk in there, they know you and your dad, you get at taken care of as opposed to just going in there once and they might just serve you what's on the menu. You order what's on the menu, you get what you order. But I, I see some creativity coming out of this, of being able to say, all right, here's what we're doing with this yellow fin today. We're, we could sear this. We could blacken it up, and it would be great with some some asparagus or some spinach or whatever. Here's what we're going to do for a living off the land sushi experiment and show like this passion and this flair for sticky rice and how to make good sticky rice because that is a very hard part of sushi to get right. It's almost like making Vietnamese soup. Are you into this whole this whole Vietnamese soup deal as much as I am? Besides sushi, the other favorite meal that I have going on right now is pho. You eat a lot of pho? No. Okay, so Vietnamese soup. I it's you can get it with rice noodles or different noodles. I try to get it with no noodles, and I get it with like beef tendon and rare steak, and it's unbelievable broth and onions and and just scallions and freaking carrots and 
It's so healthy. It's got sodium in it, but it's so freaking good. But the broth is almost impossible. I've tried it several times. I can't get it right. So I think this could be a cool thing to where we do some of this Facebook live or this Instagram live or this Zoom meeting like we're doing on this podcast. And we throw down on some of these roles where I host it. You have the fish there. You get some content of you reeling in this yellow fin. Bam. Now it's on the table. Bam. I can't say bam because that's Emerald. But you and Emily got to come up with a saying, you know, like bam, but different. And just be like, we're doing sushi today. And then let's get this out there because, dude, this shit is sought after, man. Do you know how hard it is to even get the fish to make? What if, to, we, did, what if we did something like this? All right, you I, give me yours. I overnight you some. I have mine. We invite a random person and they do taste, and we kind of have some kind of system where we score it. And then if I win, I finally make might go on a. a gut you can't do that though because you'd have to have the same judge. You couldn't have different judges because their palate's got to be the same. The judges have to be like, yeah, that's the best one there, and you know I'm going to win. I'm a freaking stud in the kitchen, kind of half ass, but you know I'm going to win that deal. No, you give me that on presentation. Well, and then we'll have pictures and looks. Oh, then put it online and say who who's who's looks better. Well, they got to taste it, man. Taste and look. That's why we have people that taste it. Okay. Well then. Let's end this podcast right now so you and Rob or, can get down to the FedEx. Or you overnight, or you overnight mine, we make a roll. I don't know. I'm just trying to make a competition. I like it. I like competition. Yeah. I like competition. No, I just cool. don't know how we could do it. I want to get it out there, though. I want to film something like this. When are you going out on the boat again? Yeah, it's not fresh now. I mean, we have a couple of people that'll, that'll make it after they freeze it, but all my elephants now frozen. When me. are you going out on the boat again? I don't know. Derek, I mean, I don't know. Really? The water's like a mile from your dad's house. I know, but with all the stuff going on and. Oh, are they preventing people from fishing down there? No way. They're trying to talk. Yeah, they're trying to. I don't, I don't know. It's just a, It's just like sketchy. We, we, we have a permit, like a commercial permit where we're allowed to kind of fish, but we want to run. We want to run over the Bahamas, but we're not sure if we're allowed over there and whatnot. Well, you're so. probably not, but you can go out and fish. They yeah, can't no, keep you dad, from fishing. My dad, my dad went. They're out right now. I'm the only one at work at the moment. Um, what are they catching today? Have they heard? Have you heard? They're going for Wahoo, my second favorite. Between Wahoo and sashimi, like Wahoo is my favorite fish raw with nothing on it. Oh, well, then I need some of that. Will you ship me some of that tomorrow? <laughs> no. <Say> yes. <laughs> yes. Know. I'm going to text no. your dad. I'm going to text your dad right now and say, have you caught a Wahoo yet? How do you spell it? W-A-H-O-O? W W-A-H-O-O. Right. Uh-huh. Ha- have you caught a Wahoo today yet? The My phone turned Wahoo to wagon. Wagon. Um, yeah, so if we catch a bunch, there's just not enough. There's not much big foot. When you do, there is a time where you can do, you can go to the Bahamas high speed troll and catch like a pile of them, like 10, catch your limit. And then you bring that back, then we could send it. But right now you're going, you're lucky to go out there and catch one. If you catch one, it's a good day. How and big one, are Wahoo? They get a hundred pounds. Tim and them have caught one right, right, right at a hundred. But I'd say, you know, if you catch a 30, 40 pounder, that's a good one. Your dad says not yet. Yeah, dude, it's three thirty there right now. They're running out of time. No, please, it's eight. Eight. please do so. I can get a little FedEx package tomorrow, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Your best friend and almost son, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> he just hit me back again. Oh, he just sent me a picture. What kind of fish is that? Look up. It's, uh, I can't see it. Go up. Go up. Oh, kingfish. Is that worth eating? Good. It makes really good smoked fish dip. I want to do it. I want to put it on a Traeger, smoke it on a Traeger, and make fish dip. So good. Oh, you know, that sounds good. Fish. I've had it. I've. Ne- I think you made it for me down there one time, but I don't. I don't think it was the best fish that I've ever eaten in Southern Florida besides bluefin tuna bluefin sushi house what town is that in it's not in boca raton it's in richland what's parkland parkland Parkland, right 
Parkland, where that crazy high school shooting was. Do they just have one? I think they have one more in Boca. Isn't that where you went to school? That was your alma mater, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, your mom's mahi with the panko was badass, but Tim Maddox hogfish. That shit is awesome. Remember that recipe he did, the, the simple baking with lemon pepper and lemon on it? I thought he, you, you haven't had the one with the mango salsa? For hog? Yeah, I think I think he made one with the mango salsa that was really well also. But hogfish, dude. You don't do you even dive for those anymore? I don't I don't go over there. Do you mean I'm sharks? Not, yeah, man. It's crazy. You can't catch them. You can shoot them, spear them. Who so who does it? Cool. Does Tim do that? Yeah, I mean, we'll go. I mean, I saw when I went to those numbers that I have in the keys, I saw probably 10 of them, but they just weren't big enough. So I think this year they should be every, I caught 300 lobster that day and all of them were like just a quarter of an inch too small to keep. What does a lobster have to be? 11 inches? No, there's just this little like measuring device that you got to stick on its tail or or actually, sorry, on its like the hard body on its head. And it's got to be bigger than that piece. And they were all just short. You didn't catch any keepers. I think we call it like a six or something like that. Maybe. When is that season in lobsters? Uh, I think it just passed, but it starts back up in July, I believe. It opens back up. It's closed for some of the spring and summer. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm hungry right now. This whole conversation has me like infatuated with raw fish. I freaking love raw fish. I know. I can't. I like, those are the people that I do want to comment on and tell them, I like just, those are the people that I want to message and tell them, dude, you're, you are out of your mind. If you don't like raw fish. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and they'll, and they'll you know, you know, when they'll be reading that, they'll read it on their phone in between bites with their custom chopsticks at their local sushi house as they shove another freaking order of mahi or maguro or salmon, whatever it is they're eating there at their sushi house. But then they look at your video and they have, they got to chastise you because they can't do it, man. I'm telling you, if anybody went and did that, what There's people out there that don't like raw fish, I'm saying, like I know several people. Oh, that just, oh, well, no, that's, that's different. That's an acquired taste. And you got to tell people like you're nuts. My, yeah. Hey, my daughter, she goes into sushi and she tastes it. She's like, I'm gonna get, I don't like the texture. The other night took that tuna you sent me. Mm-hmm. freaking seared it a little bit on each side just a tiny 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 bit of tony's on it no i was using slap your mama on it just a tiny bit and, and a little black pepper i took it off of the heat i said try that and she asked for two more pieces yeah. so now i'm slowly introducing her to it it's just an acquired taste and we're gonna get it i mean we're gonna get her to eat it but my nephew chase he's nine years old he'll eat anything on a sushi menu raw that's how my my uh my niece is she is sushi i've never seen her eat more in her life she'll eat three rolls herself and she's nine she's 10 now same thing it's insane it is and it's i don't know i just i love the idea of, of that mentality of living off the land and being a provider and anybody that that wants to insult it they can kiss my ass and i mean that because it's like we're we're not out here trying to mess with you we're just providing we're not breaking the law we're not unethical we're doing this within our means and with our god-given right and it's our, it's a privilege. It's a, you know, we have the right to hunt right now, but it's not written that we always will. I always tell people that it's a privilege. It can be taken away, so, but I'm not going to let it be taken away just because people hate on it. So man, I want to, I want to, I want to continue this talk, Brett, going into, um, I want to do another podcast, but I think that we need to do an interactive one where you have your computer set up in your kitchen and mm-hmm. we're doing this together, cooking these together. And talking yep. about what we're doing, because I'm, I have a, a big interest. I think more, more people would if they knew that they could make their own sushi. I yep. mean, we, li- we live in a special place, right? The reason I was asking you of how many guys, how many hours, what, how much fuel, you know, all the bait fish, there's a lot of expense that goes into that. But then when you cut all that fish up and you break it up and make all the rolls that you're doing, it's pennies on the dollar for how much you're paying per bite, as opposed to going to a sushi restaurant and paying retail for it. And that's what other people don't understand. Yes, there is some upfront cost, but with that upfront cost, you're getting a lot of fun and camaraderie and socializing out of that, drinking a cold beer on a boat with your dad. There's nothing better. So 
that is taken out in my opinion. But once you get the fish and you can cut it up and make your own fi- thing, it becomes affordable. You in Reno, we have very fresh fish because our sushi restaurants piggyback off of the casino industry and the casino industry and their high end five star restaurants are flying in fresh seafood every day from the coast. So our sushi restaurants are piggybacking off of that at our food service and our distributors and they're getting fresh tuna and fresh salmon and all of the fresh fishes every day. We have all you can eat here for 25 bucks with badass fresh fish. Now, when I say badass, I'm not talking at the bluefin level because that place is on a different level than most places in America, but it's expensive as hell to eat there. It's a hundred dollars per head minimum. And you probably still walk out of there pretty hungry. My point is, is that there's a lot of money. It takes a lot of money to enjoy a consistent sushi diet. Unless you live in Reno, you could eat it five days a week for 140 bucks and stuff yourself to the gills on it. But we don't do that. I'm just saying that if we gave people an idea like, look, man, you could go buy a raw tuna steak at Costco right now. It's not as fresh as yours, but you could still tie it into a sushi recipe. I think it'd be badass. I think that that is an art and I'd like to learn how to do it better. So let's, let's get one of these, uh, I guess you got to get some fish and then, Mm -hmm. and then schedule it with me to where we can jump on here and do an interactive one of roles. And maybe we can do it live to where people are giving us ideas or asking us questions and we can answer them. Yeah. Cause you you can do that on Instagram or stuff like that too, right? Can't you have two people live? You kind of join together on like your account or something and then we could do it. Yeah. It's yeah. called, it's called IG live plus one oh. plus one. That's kind of like your household these days. Plus <laughs> one. So what's I, uh, kid up to? Is kid doing anything? Is he fishing? Is he, what's yeah, he? Yeah, I saw, I saw the day he's out there fishing. He's, he's, uh, man, he's in a weird spot because he got, he got sick and, um, he got tested and he got tested for the flu and he didn't have the flu. And then he went to go get the COVID test and we went there, they didn't have enough tests. And they're like, well, you know, we probably want to save these tests for like elderly. And so he went back to the house. That was like horrible. And then he's just friends with so many people down there, like news anchors and all this stuff. And they, he had interaction with them and they were all like, listen, you have to go get tested. And so he went back and got tested and they said it came back negative, but he's like, I, I didn't have the flu and I was deathly, I felt horrible. He's like, but when I had my worst symptoms, he's like, I felt like I was there. Like when I went to the doctor and they didn't give me the test because I felt bad, like someone like my mother or something like that. He's like, I wanted him to have a test. So then we went back and he's like, so I don't know. I, he feels like he had the virus. So now he's like, but I don't know for sure. And he hasn't had left the house in, I think it's like four weeks now. Now it hasn't left the house. And now today he's out fishing. If he goes fishing, he goes buy him like with one other guy that he knows that has been whatever, but he's just like either fishing by himself or going and like, it's weird. He's just laying low. Yeah. Hasn't left the house in four weeks yet. We, he's went gone like fishing like twice on his boat. Cause right, boat's but back but you know top. what? You're looking at a guy that's done the same thing. The only place that I've been, I went to the store one time with my shirt up over my face and got some stuff. And the only other place I go is to take my daughter to her mom. That's it. I have not left. Yeah. You with your lungs and stuff can't like, I can't take a chance. You can't take a chance. There's no way. And I and I uh, I'm not. And my daughter's got a little asthma now, which I hate that I've given it to her genetically. It pisses me off. But we're just doing the best we can. We're hunkered down. We're staying home. We're following the guidance of our leadership in the country and the scientists and the medical doctors and President Trump's administration. And we're just supporting what they're doing. And if they're saying stay home and let's curve this deal, then freaking do it. You know, just stay away from people. Stay. They say six feet groups, of, you know, less than 10. We're, I'm, I'm not I don't have anybody over here. So, yeah. um, you know, we have very quarantine office where we're way far away from each other. But as far as socializing, it's literally nothing. It yeah. sucks, but it's also taught me a lot of good values to get back to and patience and pumping the brakes and, and family and, and paying attention to little things because in my daily rig and row or traveling, you, a lot of things get taken for granted. And this is showing me those dinners with friends, those little league baseball games, those wrestling matches, those dance recitals, those fishing trips, those turkey hunting trips, those dinners, everything there is is not to be taken for granted. We live in the greatest country in the world. That's why you can go out and catch mahi and tuna and yellowfin like you did, even though haters are going to hate. We live in the greatest country in the world. And now we're starting to see like when your rights are taken away from you, 
Could you oh. imagine living in a communist society, a communist society where you couldn't go hunting? You had no rights. You couldn't, you couldn't go watch a movie when you wanted or go to a local pub and have a beer with your buddies after an eight hour shift at work. It's all teaching me like, dude, we need to come out of this, not just, you know, stronger as a community. We need to come out of here smarter, wash your hands more, take more showers, take care of your personal hygiene more. Think about the people around you. If you do have a cold or the common flu or the common cold, don't go to work that day. You know, be, be courteous of others and, and, and know that, know that we've gone through this and learn something from it. Be a sponge right now. Learn something about yourself. Learn something about community, leadership, everything. There's a lot of shit going on that we could be learning right now. Oh yeah. I agree hundred percent. Buddy, this has been fun. I'm starving. I'm honestly, one of the things is, you know, we can do curbside pickup here, but I'm, I'm not supporting restaurants through this physically. I'm buying gift cards to give out to people to spend on if they want curbside now or when the restaurants get back open, but to create some revenue, we're buying some gift cards. I don't know if I can withstand not ordering some sushi right now and getting some curbside pickup though, but I don't know if that's a smart thing to do. I, well, I have to be, man, I'm my, our business is essential. So I have to go to work. So I have to go to gas stations. I have to do that. And I got four bottles, a lot of hand sanitizer in my truck. It's just like, well, that's more than any store in my city has in their store. So cherish yeah. that, wear yeah. a mask, stay home, make sure that you're not get a, Don't get a cough. Don't touch your face. Give Emily a hug. Tell her I can't wait to meet her in person. And then tell you. And I'm going fishing by like with one other person. So that's, that's what I'm doing. That's good. You got to just stay smart. Stay away from people. Stay home. Love you like a brother. Tell your dad that Wahoo, he can ship it tomorrow. You already got my address. Um, whatever barter system we need, a little trade out here and there, a little Jack Link's cold craft. Listen, I'm waiting for my box. You know, you got a random box in the mail. I can't wait to see what mine is. Right. Send me your address. Send me your <clears throat> I don't have the new address. You got my, my old address, my work address. Send me the address it, it has to go to. I might I might have a little something something for you. God, if they only knew that we were I, just, I, I wonder if you're I wonder uh, if you're allowed. Can you ship wild fish across the country? I don't know. Come give me a ticket. I don't care. I don't care. Okay. I'm eating it. Um I do need a 20 gauge Benelli. <clears throat> but for what? Duck hunters are lame. And you're, I know you're not going to get a turkey close enough for that, even with TSS. Um, you shoot them at 70. Ooh, 70 feet. All right, I'm getting off here. This has been another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody. Check out Brett Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N, at Brett Cannon on Instagram. Follow his badass content, his fishing career. We didn't even get into Lake Okeechobee and his talents as a bass fisherman. I, I, I'm uh, podcasting um, tomorrow or Monday with Slayton Blaylock. You know that name? Stetson. Stetson Blaylock, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Stetson's. A, uh, yeah, I met him. He's a he's an awesome angler. Dude, guy. I just messed up his name because I get, I just got a text from my duck a guy that's helping me with some duck call whistles named Slayton Garen. So I said <laughs> instead of Tets, I read this text from Slayton and I go Slayton. I'm sorry, Stetson. Stetson Blaylock, you know, part of the Real Tree Fishing Team and Bassmaster. He's won the Elite, and so he's coming on the podcast, and I'm going to talk about baits and 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 how to catch bass. I should have talked to you a little bit about that, but I might as well go to the master, huh? Yeah, he's uh he's good, man. He's have you dude. fished with him? I have not. I have not. I'd like to fish with him. He's he was yeah, he was just in the Bass Masters. I was watching him live on the classic, man. I was rooting for him. I was rooting for him, but yeah. I think um I got I'd like to fish with him. I'd learn a lot. Well, let's go. I want to learn I want to catch some bass. I want to learn top water. I want to learn small mouth, large mouth. I want to go to Okeechobee. I got to get down there. When this is over, when I when this is over, I'm coming down there. Is September a good month to catch sales in? historically i thought it was because i'd come every september and we'd hammer them i'd go to the benelli invitational before last year every year i'd go to the benelli invitational in maryland and then fly straight from baltimore straight into fort lauderdale and we'd hammer sales in september that takes place in september every year yeah i think we i know it's, it's is it got to be colder than that is it a little bit later than that that's good yeah, probably later but we've caught them in september on yeah, several it, trips it, it, they'll be around you get lucky catch a couple maybe you know i bring the luck but, all right i'll let you get back to work i appreciate everything tell your dad that address is the same for the wahoo another awesome episode with brett cannon this life ain't for everybody tom do me a favor please hit that button leith lofton what you gonna do when the money's all gone thank you we're all equal that's what i think i don't believe heaven has a bank make good use of your time on earth